to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. In today's episode, and also next week, Reed, we're going to have two episodes with these two gentlemen, Major Jim Nardelli and Lieutenant Colonel Josh Hawkins, both from the talent management cell at Headquarters Air Force A1H. Actually, Jim just moved on from that, but we started having the conversation about doing these two episodes. One that you're listening to today about the 38 Foxtrot Force Support Career Field, and then next week will be on the Airman Leadership Qualities. They were both working in the talent management cell there at Headquarters Air Force. So great amount of experience between these two gentlemen on the force support side of things, as well as big strategic vision, Headquarters Air Force perspective on things. And I could not be more excited about the conversation that we're about to introduce our audience to. Colin, do you know how I know it's going to be a good episode? How is that? When I'm doing my prep and I forgot to write any notes down because I was too busy <laughs> listening. That doesn't happen too often. Most often I'm paying enough attention to get the subject matter, to start thinking of ideas. But this time I was just listening. I had to go back and do it again. So that's how I knew it was going to be a good episode. Major Nardelli, Lieutenant Colonel Hawkins, great information. And I think we're going to really open some eyes here. Yeah. The 38 Foxtrot Force Support Career Field is one of those that is kind of undersung, you know, doesn't get a lot of the accolades and the excitement that so many of, especially the operational career fields do. But I think as we go through this interview and our commentary in the end, the audience will hopefully start to appreciate how crucial this specific skill set is to the Air Force in general, but also the military as a whole. You know, so much of what we are able to do is directly a result of the force support career field. Agreed. And with that, Colin, let's turn it over to you and Major Nardelli and Lieutenant Colonel Hawkins. Jim, Josh, welcome to the Commission Ed Podcast. Super excited to have you both here today, obviously to discuss first off the 38 Foxtrot for support officer career field, but also signaling to the audience to stick around for the next episode coming up next week, where we will also discuss the airman leadership qualities, which comes from your office there at headquarters Air Force. But before we get into any of that, let's give you both the opportunity to introduce yourselves a little bit. Jim, we're going to start with you and then go to Josh, give you both the chance to give your background. Where'd you come from? How did you get into the Air Force? some of the highlights, things that you've been able to do over the course of your career. And then we'll start digging a little bit more into the force support career field. All right. Awesome. Thanks, Colin. I'm Jim Nardelli. I'm a major in the 38F career field, born and raised in North Jersey. And then I went to college in Ohio at Miami University, did the ROTC program there, studied diplomacy and foreign affairs, and at the time kind of aspired to be an intel officer. But as things okay. will, will work their way out, right, became a, a force support officer. I think I likened it to that the Air Force knew what I needed to be doing better than I did. Okay. So I then commissioned in into our force support career field, like I said. And I see what you're doing there. You're saying, hey, these force support guys, these personnelists, they know better than the rest of us. I, and, <laughs> you know, you're laying the groundwork real early here for the right, conversation right. we're having here in a little bit. Right. <laughs> no, that's a common stereotype about us, right? Is that we, <laughs> we, the force support officers, you know, wherever we're working at, we usually have a hand in everything. You do. <laughs> yes. That's why I think Colonel Hawkins and I were really excited to be talking about the career field with you guys today. And you're just a quick rundown of where I've been. I actually just started my fifth assignment. Okay. But my first assignment was at Nellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas, Nevada. An awesome place to start. A huge fighter base. Really got to know that mission really well. Then I went to Kunsan, Korea. Then from there, after a year on the peninsula, went to Spangdalem Air Base in Germany. You know, just a series of hardship tours, if you will. Right. Uh, I was yeah. going to say. And, and then uh, from there, went to the Pentagon. 
Okay. Where Hardship I, tour. Yes. And so four years on the air staff. And then I literally just started over at Joint Base Andrews as the four sports squadron operations officer there. And so kind of excited. With the 316th, right? Yeah, with the 316th. Okay. And so that's my 10-year career in probably 45 seconds. No, that's excellent. And I bring up the 316th because I was also there at Joint Base Andrews. It was called the 11th wing at the time. The 11th wing has since shifted. And, and it was the 316th when I got my first set of orders coming up, you know, onto active duty. I was going to the 316th. By the time I got there, it was the 11th. Then I left you know, left active duty, been doing lots of other things. It's now the 316th again. All that was old is now new and things that are new are now old. So yes, <laughs> that's just <laughs> kind of how this goes, right? Exactly. The circle yeah. of life in the Air Force. Exactly. Excellent. Yes. Okay. So 10 years of being a force support officer in 45 seconds. Let's see if we can give Colonel Hawkins, Josh here, you get 60 seconds to distill your 15 plus years in the Air Force for the audience here. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Colin. And thanks, Jim. Yeah. So like Jim, force support officer, career force support officer now coming up on 18 years, Lieutenant Colonel. I'm from Texas. I commissioned out of ROTC at Texas Christian University. Okay. You know, I'm old enough that I originally came in as a services officer for the first six years or so of my career and did some deployed services work early in that time. I was out at Aviano, again, a hardship tour, Yeah. Uh, but welcome to the services and the force support world. We're everywhere. So I went from Aviano to bowling, and I know all about the original 11th wing. Before you met the 11th wing, it was the real 11th wing at bowling. Right, okay. Yeah, and got some time there at the Air Force Honor Guard, went to the Air Force Colonels Group shortly after the A-1 transformation that brought together manpower, personnel, and services, Okay. and worked at the Air Force Colonels Group, bounced over to be an aide in Ramstein, followed that out at the Thunderbirds as the executive officer out at Nellis, so got to see Jim a little bit at the same installation, as it were, and then went to go to be an OPSO. So got my experience, what Jim's doing right now, down at McDill, enjoyed that thoroughly. Got to spend a year out in Afghanistan, traveling around in Afghanistan, doing some deployed 38F work, and then got to school. So I did my IDE at Leavenworth, went to command up at Joint Base Elmendorf Richardson, and thoroughly enjoyed the opportunity to command the FSS up there. Went to AFPC, went to school to SDE at National Defense University, just finished that up and joined the A1H Talent Management Innovation Cell team here. So that was about 12 PCSs, okay. uh, nine or 10 different you know, jobs. And I think I busted my hit time, but pretty quickly though, the 18 years flies by. Yeah, it absolutely does. Actually, you started services and then when the career field changed, when things were fused together, brought into for support, it shows the breadth and the depth of what four support officers are able to do. No two careers are exactly the same, and yet lots of similarities. Lots of opportunity to do things here in the States, go overseas, deployed opportunities, being at the Pentagon, working staff, working policy, working command. I mean, we're gonna get into this here in a, in a second, but it just shows to the audience here that the four support officer is everywhere all the time, and there are so many different things that you can be involved in. Absolutely. Yeah, well, so let's start getting into some of that nitty gritty. People wanna hear about what is the career field. We call it force support, but what is that actually? Nobody really knows until we start breaking it down exactly what it is that the force support officer, the force support squadron as a whole is actually in charge of, unless they're in support, unless they are interfacing with the manpower, the personnel side of things, services, you know, mortuary affairs, I'm sure we're gonna get into that too. Unless they see it, unless they are interacting with it, most people just don't know what this career field does. So Jim, if you wouldn't mind, let's start breaking this down. What is the career field, 38 Foxtrot, Give us some ideas of what this career field is responsible for. So the way I like to break it down to my peers is, you know, we had that oldest time debate. Is it people first, mission always, or mission first, mm. people always? For a force support officer, it's both because our mission is people, right? We take care of airmen and guardians and their families, our retirees and our civilian partners as well. We take, if anybody's on an installation, odds are we're supporting them in one way or another or just interacting with them and impact. And so that really is, and, and, Oftentimes with each passing year, I discover something else that 
is done in my career field, right? And one of those unique opportunities of where we impact it. But I think the easiest way to capture probably about 90% of what we do, you kind of already outlined it, is manpower, personnel, and services. And manpower is a lot of making sure that we're adequately resourced and that we're utilizing the manning that's authorized to us, right? That as yep. we look at this big bucket of manning that the Air Force has, breaking that down and making sure that we're properly allocating those manning resources to each of the units at every echelon. And that's a pretty complex thing when you think about how big the Air Force is and how we have to centrally manage it, but decentrally execute it. Yeah. And I will say manpower is an area that I don't have as much experience in. And people probably much smarter than me are doing great work over in those areas. And it's definitely something that if you get it wrong, can have impact years down the road if you get those manning allocations off. Yeah. So if I understand it correctly, I may be totally off here because I've never been a commander. I've never been an operations officer. I've never been the one who's actually looking at the manning document, the thing that says, this is what your unit is authorized. I know what it is, but I've never really used it. But when you talk manpower, that's what we're discussing here is the authorizations from Congress through half all the way down into your unit, that these are the number of people in this particular grade, also to include civilians and contractors, right? These are the people that you are allowed to use, that you are authorized to use for the accomplishment of the mission. Is that correct? Yes, though I would make one mild modification, which is okay. these are the spaces that you are authorized. Okay. We use spaces and faces All as right. the way to keep them separate. Manpower, if you have a vacant billet, the manpower office is not gonna help you. If you feel that you are undermanned in the sense mm. of that when you look at your manning document and you're going, it says I'm allowed two 38 Foxtrots and 10 three Foxtrot zeros for yeah. a personnel flight or section. And you feel that your mission drives that you should have five more manning authorizations, five more funded billets on your manning document. The manpower office can look at the standard and apply those and work it at the base level to see if you earn additional funded billets. Okay. And then it flows into the personnel side of things, which one of the sub functions of personnel is making sure that we're putting the right faces in those spaces. Uh, it's a little cheesy, okay, but that's honestly yeah. been the, the easiest way for me to keep them straight is just manpower is all about spaces. And it's one of those things like, hey, we've got you more manning and, you know, awesome. When is it going to be here? Well, it's going to get loaded in a year and then it'll take <laughs> us a little bit, right? Sometimes there is that lag time there because you have to project these things out. So that's a really helpful way to think about it. I'd never heard it that way, spaces versus faces, that these are the number of spots or seats on the bus that you have authorized. And then the faces, the personnel side of things are actually putting butts in those seats. You know, maybe I shouldn't have said it that way, you know, butts and faces, or, you know, putting people on the bus for you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't think we'll be using that in our talking points. Okay. When we're training the next generation. Okay, so this is why I'm not a, a personnel <laughs> or force support officer. This <laughs> but the bus metaphor is a good one in that, hey, I have this many seats, but I'm short on people. That's where, again, the force support community will help you solve that issue. Okay. But before we go over to personnel, Colonel Hawkins, did I miss anything on manpower? No, no, I, I don't think you did. I think you gave it a good summary for Colin, and I like the way you also kind of internalize it as well, Colin, because ultimately – like we're gonna talk about for many things that we do in the force support community, really our customer is both the Air Force and the installation users, right? And so yeah. what Jim's talking about is is the squadrons, you know, at the tactical level. And that scales all the way up to the strategic level when the chief of staff looks to the A1 to ask if we've got you know, our operational units manned appropriately. Mm -hmm. And so that goes at all levels. And I think that that bus metaphor works well. Okay, cool. Maybe not a bus, maybe a C-17, you know, a flying bus, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, put it back in the Air Force context. Yes. And we need to fill that C-17 with all the proper packs. Great. Okay. That's starting to make more sense for me. So that's manpower. Now, Colonel Hawkins, if you wouldn't mind, give us a synopsis of personnel what that side of force support is trying to accomplish. Yeah, so I would say, I mean, it's good that Jim gave us the good talking point of spaces and faces, right? And so 
traditionally when we think about personnel, that is about making sure that we've got the people in the authorizations. I think that's the easy thing that most of us, if we're uniform service members or used to be a uniform service member, you're familiar with an assignment at some point in your life, you've had one of those yep. and you've gone through that process. And that's probably your first contact point with the personnel community. But the personnel community is more than that. You know, it's both military and civilian. So all of our, our Air Force civilians, for sure, for whom which, you know, we cannot do our mission. It really doesn't matter what your function is in the Air Force. Our civilian partners are critical. And that civilian personnel function is one that falls underneath the A1 community, the force support community. But beyond just assignments, we're talking about career management and what we would call, as A1 professionals, we would call workforce management. Yeah. So both your military workforce management and your civilian workforce management, which really has to get to the sustainment of the mission at whatever you know operational level that's happening, tactical, operational, strategic, making sure that we've got the right people with the right skills, that we're retaining them, that we're developing them. And I should actually start, we start at the acquisition that we're recruiting and acquiring right. the right people with the right skills, that we're going to develop the right skills, that we're gonna utilize those skills correctly and that we can eventually transition them, whether that's uh, through separation or retirement. Those are really the way we look at the life cycle of bringing an airman in, capital A, yeah. total force, inclusive. Uh, and so that's really kind of how the personnel function looks at it. And I think some easy programs that most of us are familiar with are assignments, promotions, reenlistments, you know, for our enlisted airmen, that kind of maybe four letter word onboarding for our civilian, <laughs> those of us who have worked with civilian, bringing a civilian member on, because certainly our civilians are great, but the process to bring them on has been maturing, yeah. you know, and improving for sure. But those are all the things I think a lot of us think about. And like you said, Colin, you want to kind of pull the curtain back a little bit so that your listeners can understand more about personnel. And the one I would really talk to that I'm kind of bringing it full circle is really about workforce and talent management. How do we make sure we've got the right people with the right skills, we develop those skills, and that we utilize them appropriately? Because that's kind of one of the basic keys to retention. If, yeah. And I said it earlier, you know, Jim and I both being HR professionals, if you extracted us out of the Air Force and put us in a private firm, you know, we're going to be working in that HR department. Right. And these are the same things that industry is grappling with right now. How do they compete for those high school graduates, for those college graduates that are propensed to serve are the same things we confront, you know, just for military service and for civilian service. Yeah, absolutely. So, Obviously, we're going to get into the conversation, especially in next week's episode, about that talent management, the recruiting, the retention, the proper utilization of that talent throughout the Air Force. So you know, to the audience, stick around. You know, we're going to get into all of that. But the bottom line is here that that whole function is housed under personnel, both at the base level, all the way up through the MAGCOMs, up to half A1, which is where both of you are working now. Yeah. Yeah, you nailed it. And, you know, big family, we talk about it as an A1 enterprise where we're talking constantly to make sure that, you know, as Jim marches out to work in the FSS, that he's got the right resources and policies to support him at the installation level. And that what makes sense, he's going over to Andrews. What makes sense at Andrews also makes sense for our airmen out at Peterson or, you know, you pick a base. Yeah, I'm just going to say this, though, that nothing makes sense at Andrews. I'm, <laughs> I'm just, you know... <laughs> Love Joint Base Andrews, but it's very special. The NCR is a special location. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Bless you, Jim. Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we've got one more section of the Force Support Squadron, the Force Support Officer that we haven't really yet touched on, and that's the services, right? Jim, give us another broad overview of what the services portion of the career field does. All right, I'll start us off. You know, it's very rare that you get a core services officer right. in the room with you. So I, I will quickly hand things over to Colonel Hawkins. But services, this is where I think we oftentimes can have an outsized influence on a base through services. We're talking about feeding operations, lodging operations, fitness operations. I remember one time on one of my deployments, you know, my services airmen were really getting kind of, we were getting a lot of complaints, right? Yeah. And my airmen, were, it was hard for them to take it personally. And I was talking with them, and then the, I remember our chaplain piped in. He's like, they complain because what you do is something that they care about. 
Hmm. And that really stuck with me yep. is that odds are the services airmen provide something that's very important to you. Right. Sometimes it's something as basic as food. Yeah. Other times it's ensuring that you have an adequate workout facility. You know, we were in a bear base, you know, our fitness center was a tent and we were finding ways to make things work. And it's really, especially in that installation level, you're providing Maslow's hierarchy of of most basic needs. Mm, I like that shelter for them via the building and lodging, the food that they need. And then that fitness to help get them, you know, to keep their strength up as well as a couple other other functions that kind of fall under MWR, morale, wellness, and recreation. So it's a lot of the fun stuff, but it's also a lot of those most basic needs that airmen need, and especially in the deployed environment. But with that, I'm definitely going to turn over to Colonel Hawkins because he has a lot more... Cert- His six years of services experience, I think, outweighs my personnel experience in the Air Force. Yeah. No, I think Jim did a great overview. You know, a lot of times I talk about services, especially in my, in my more recent years in my career, when I talk to friends in the sister service that, you know, we are the only service that continues to have blue suitors who provide a core function of sustainment. Hmm. And so we talked to you already about what force support officer is, what the force support community is. It really is about sustainment and the services component does the people sustainment. And that's a real thing. I mean, I think COVID has highlighted that for many people who may not have realized it or appreciated it. And frankly, you know, I don't have a lot of fault in that because a lot of things of what we do in the services mission set of the force support community are things that make our lives normal. Yeah. You know, that's one of the things that Jim kind of teed up for me that he didn't hit on that's close to home for me is taking care of family members. You know, that runs the gamut from kids that runs all the way to, you know, to teens. We do in-home care for families that have got particular our requirements or developmental requirements for their kids. We've got, like I mentioned, the teen centers. We'll scale that all the way up to camps that we're running across the Air Force, overseas, where it's difficult to get that camp experience when you're overseas. Yeah. He talked about downrange. I don't want to talk about the kids downrange. That's not where I was going, but he talked about the services that we're offering downrange. And then we take that another step further, which is, you know, our library, which gets back to the people development, our library and resource centers and our training programs that we're offering. And then continuing on to our mortuary care that we provide for everybody that's an authorized mortuary recipient in the Air Force. So both our active duty members, which is a very solemn duty that I know all of our force support counterparts, you know, take very seriously. Yeah. Down to our family members. When we're deployed, where we're overseas, we're providing mortuary support from the U.S. that isn't maybe necessarily available from the local government or the local economy. So those are, you know, I get back to, I said sustainment and people sustainment. To me, those are really the core things that make the services mission set particularly unique. And I said earlier when I talked to my joint counterparts, you know, we're the only service that's still got blue suitors that are trained and performing that. And I know that we're really focusing on the force support officer, but I do want to definitely give a huge nod to our services enlisted airmen who really are, frankly, the backbone of delivering that program well, as well as our services civilian. So especially in the child and family programs mission set, those are civilians who they are dedicated to child development. Most of them have got master's degrees and above in that, and they love that mission and they love doing it even more for military members. So really great opportunity that our Air Force and our guardians have got to take advantage of the services mission set and force support. Yeah, I love how you both explained it, especially that use of Laszlo's hierarchy. That just makes so much sense to me now. Like I knew what services was. I go to the gym, you know, I go work out. So I'm interacting with services there. When I stay on base, you know, when I go TDY, I want to have a nice place to sleep. You know, I want to have a nice place to eat, right? These things that I do care about, just like what you were saying, Jim, These are things that I care deeply about, but putting it in the context of Laszlo's hierarchy that you have to have these things in place before you're ever going to be able to fully carry out the mission on behalf of the Air Force. I mean, if I haven't eaten, it's going to be really hard for me to focus on the things that I need to do. If I haven't slept well, that's just asking for trouble, right? And so seeing it in terms of Laszlo's hierarchy and this people sustainment, not just mission sustainment, which is clearly a very important thing that we do in the Air Force, but putting in the terms of people sustainment is fantastic. I love all of that. But to what you were just saying there, Josh, about the enlisted being the people who actually do all of this, 100%. 
yes, we, the officers, are ultimately responsible for the execution of each of these different things, but you're not there doing all of the manpower authorizations. You're not, you know, doing all of the paperwork required to cut orders and get people their assignments. You're not running the gym and the lodging facility and the dining facility and, 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 right? You're not doing all of these things. <laughs> we rely entirely on our enlisted and our civilian workforce to make those things possible. Yeah. Yeah. And I think rely is even for our conversation, a little bit of an understatement for sure. Yeah. There are FSS organizations and then Air Force installations that are majority civilian, majority enlisted for sure. And to that point, like you're saying, we have got a great force of professionals, whatever, you know, whether they wear a uniform or not, whether they've got rank on there, I guess now with all of us in OCPs, we've all got it right on our chest, right? But yeah. whether it's insignia or stripes or chevrons, whatever that they may be wearing, when they fall under the A1 and the force support professional community, something that I think often about, especially as I've done more and more joint you know, roles and I've worked in more joint environments is we are combat support professionals, just like many of our combat support you know, brethren, whether they are in comptroller or acquisitions or you know, security forces, base defense, we're combat support professionals, but we also recognize we're an integral part of making sure the Air Force operations are ready to go. Yeah. And so we're not operators. I would tell my organization, if any of my airmen are listening, they'll have heard this before when I was a squadron commander, when I was ops officer. Our reason for existing is to ensure the mission is supported. That is why we are mission support professionals, combat support professionals. But the mission is critically tied to making sure that we get airmen and guardians ready. Again, whether they're wearing a uniform or not, including those airmen and guardian civilians, that they're ready when they drop their kid off, when they go to the dining facility, when they go to lodging, they're waiting for their orders. I mean, how many of us have been waiting for orders, right? Like yeah. <laughs> those are all experiences that orbit around, you know, the force support community performing our work well. I love it. So I do have to ask here because I ask this in every episode, right? And this kind of tees it up pretty well. If they're doing all of the work, you know, the enlisted and the civilians are doing it, why have the force support officer. Why do we need the 38 Foxtrot? So I think it kind of boils down to a force support squadron is that consolidated team that's doing that mission sustainment, that people sustainment mission. And so you have to bring together all of these different functions. And that's done through the force support squadron commander. And as we work to develop that position, right, and most of the officer corps, especially when you look to our history in the army, where we start them young, and they learn and they grow into that command position. The force support officers are there as that level of kind of level of higher responsibility, right? And helping make those tougher decisions. And what I oftentimes tell young force support officers is, is that you really need to focus in on leadership, right? And adapting to the different jobs that are put before you, because oftentimes the details of the problems are different, but the nature of the problem is similar. And so I think for support officer, like many of our other combat support brothers and sisters, we are faced with leadership dilemmas at a much younger age in our careers compared to maybe some of our operational partners. At my first job, I was second in command of a 300, almost 400 person organization. And then my boss went on maternity leave and I was in charge, 22 year old kid. And that for support officer was there. No pressure. Right. And I had great chiefs, right, who refused to let me fail despite my best efforts. <laughs> and to this day, hey, shout out to Brad Bailing and Chris Tony. They're the reason I still have a career. But with that, on top of that, our enlisted airmen are focused on taking care of those actions and getting it done and supporting that mission. And the force support officer is also looking up and outwards, right? Setting that vision for the organization, looking out and looking to reach out to the other organizations and say, hey, we need your help, right? We're doing a bed down plan. And I need support, my squadron needs support from CE, because while we can provide space for people to sleep, we can't provide latrines. We can't provide the other things that our engineers provide to make sure that that's actually a sustainable bed down plan. And that's also where those officers at a very young age can reach out to their peers and start building up those relationships so that by the time they're a commander, it's second nature. I will stop there because I will also say I have not reached that point of command. And I'd be very interested to hear Colonel Hawkins thoughts on this. 
Yeah. I mean, I think Jim nailed a lot of the same things that I would offer. And I'd certainly caveat both of our answers with, we've got a community of leaders that may certainly have some different perspectives on it within the force support community. And I hope and know, I would even say, they'd add some additional perspectives to giving you an answer on this. But the things that I would hit on is, you know, why we have a force support officer is first and foremost that the Air Force has identified that people and quality of life are important to our operation. And so I should say the Department of the Air Force has because our force support officers provide the same, you know, support to our guardians that we're doing to our airmen. And the Department of the Air Force has said, this is a function that we value intensely because of what it does to support our people and the mission. You know, it's a force multiplier for both the people and the mission for reasons that you already outlined, right? Like you talked about your experiences in the gym and being able to focus on the mission. I think the other area that you'd look at is like all AFSCs, like whether it's enlisted or officer and frankly, civilian career series. What you do as a second lieutenant is different than what you're tending to be responsible for and focusing on as a field grade officer like Jim is, and then maybe even a field grade officer like some recent experiences I've had or, or even the ones I've got right now. And so for sure, those second lieutenants when I was a second lieutenant, I was side by side with my airmen in the dining facility as a young food service officer. And truth be told, I did that more than a handful of times as a squadron commander, too, yeah. just working in the dining facility to make sure I still knew what was up. And they're telling me like, hey, you need, you're not cutting correctly. You're not using the right cutting technique in the back. But the point is that, you know, I think all of us as officers have got a wide berth of tactical to operational and strategical scope that we have to maintain. So even that second lieutenant, we charge that level of officer, that level of development to be understanding the strategic impacts of that group of, you know, 200 plus that they're walking out there to lead. And so I bring that up because I think in the Air Force, we've continued to realize credibility matters yeah. in the development. Remember, I talked about the development and utilization of our people. That includes our own community, that credibility matters in how we develop our leaders. And we're just one of the three personnel pieces within the community. It's officer, civilian, and enlisted. So we have senior civilians, we have senior enlisted leaders, and we've got senior officers. And the way we grow those senior officers is we have, you know, a core of junior officers that grow through experiences and advance to the rank. So that'd be kind of my big look at it is the Air Force values it a lot. That's why we've continued to resource the officer community. And I would offer, too, that more than once I've had sister service senior officers, some in the GO level, mm -hmm. ask, hey, how come the Air Force does something that way? And a lot of times after we sit down and have a you know cold beverage and I'm getting mentoring and I'm sharing a perspective, it's, the reason is because the Air Force has got a lot of knowledge built up in our A1 community through the Civilian Officer and Enlisted Corps because of how we develop them. Yeah. If I'm going to distill down what I've heard from both of you in the justification for the force support officer, it comes down to the connections between people, relationships, and those relationships and those people matter deeply to the Air Force. That's the ultimate responsibility then of the force support officer is to foster, grow, develop, and ensure the success of people and relationships. Yeah, I love it. I think we've all heard the relationships matter. And, you know, you just you just did the ring on that bell right there for that. <laughs> yeah, one. I agree. All right. I, I will also just say uh, we had a missed opportunity here for sometimes, you know, it's like, the, what would you say you do here? Like they're in the office space. I'm a people person. <laughs> yeah. I'm a pe I help people <laughs> is also probably, a, you know, while that's a comedic scene, that is generally the point of a force support officers. You have officers in the United States Air Force. And, you know, the 38 F's are only in the Air Force, but we support Space Force and we are all about people. Yeah. And you have a section of your officer corps that is dedicated towards that. Here's the really interesting thing about it is when people like outside of the military think about the Air Force, what do they think of? They think of jets. They think of, you know, supersonic, hypersonic technology, missiles flying around, nuclear weapons. They don't think about people. Like if you ask them to think about the army, what do they think of? <laughs> 
they think of the soldier. They think of people. People, yeah, right? the soldier, yeah. And yet, if I'm understanding you correctly, Josh, that the other services don't manage people, don't sustain people quite to the same level as we do in the Air Force. So not only are we about the technology, but we're also about the people that use the technology. Yeah, and I think I've got, you know, sister servers, peers who are going to take umbrage to me saying it that way, right? Uh, they don't listen to this podcast anyway. Yeah, yeah. No, I, but I, I think that the, the truth is exactly what you said, really, that our sister services, they certainly do take care of their people. There's no question about that. But the Air Force really, really values our organization taking care of people and our family members and because of the mission. And I love the way you linked people and technology because of exactly what you said. I, I think the Air Force is you know, known everywhere as like jets, space, missiles. And it's that tech. But the thing that I know we're talking about, some things we'll talk to in a future episode, but what keeps people in organizations is their relationships with people. We can develop the best and train the best. And you've done a lot in your own career training airmen, right? And we can spend tons and tons of money training them. But what makes people stay is when you really think about how you're taken care of, how you're peers and your friends are taken care of, how your family's taken care of in that organization. Yeah, you hear it all the time that people join for the mission because they think jets are cool. They want to fly around with their hair on fire. Great. That's why they come into the Air Force and we'll keep them. We'll take them for that reason. But why do they stay? Just as you said, it's very rare that somebody stays because, man, they love getting up at 2 a.m., going and sitting in the briefing room, being there for, you know, three hours prior to being stuck in a cockpit for another eight hours, just to come back and be in another briefing room for another three hours. You know, that's not the thing that keeps them in the Air Force. It is the relationships with the people who are also getting up at 3 a.m., going to the debriefing room, stuck <laughs> in a cockpit with them. You know, people keep people in the Air Force. All right, so that is a great place to kind of leave that discussion, signal to the conversation that we're gonna be having next week about the airman leadership qualities, recruiting, retention, development of the airmen. But let's shift there back to a little bit more of the career field. Jim, if you wouldn't mind, run us kind of through the developmental process of the officer career in the 38 Foxtrot career field. Like, how do you get in? Like, what sort of degree do you have to have? What is your ability? You know, what are your assignments like? What is your potential for promotion? Give us an idea of what people can expect. Absolutely. So when we look at how do we create a 38 Foxtrot, I will first and foremost say there is not a specific degree that will guarantee you, you know, a slot in our career field. Like I said, my degree was in diplomacy and foreign affairs. Okay. And I met officers with pretty much every single degree that you can think of inside our community. And so it's more of just, I would say that for those cadets and, and those young folks who are thinking of, and I can't believe I'm at that point in my life where I'm saying those young folks. Those young people. Right. <laughs> those young whippersnappers. Yeah, the, those kids these days. <laughs> Get off my right? lawn. <laughs> if you're thinking of joining and you have a passion for supporting the mission and a passion for taking care of people, I would say with whatever source you're coming through, indicate that this is a career field that you're interested in. And so what will happen is, is you'll find out, I remember as a cadet, found out at the end of my junior year, hey, you're going to be a 38 Foxtrot and, you know, you're going to report to your base and on this date. And so reported in, started to work, hadn't been to tech school and was like, all right, you're a deputy flight commander now, go. Yeah. And honestly, you know, some people would say like, what? But honestly, the best way to learn what we do is by doing it. And so our tech school does a really good job of covering the basics of all the different aspects that are in our career field. But you really, you need to immerse yourself in what it means to be a 38 box, 38F and force support officer. So I think I went to tech school actually about a year into my time, but that was because due to mission needs and manning issues, my commander actually delayed my going because he was like, hey, I just spent six months teaching this kid this job. I'm going to wait until he's one year into that job. You can teach him the rest. So, but some officers will go right away after arriving to their new duty station. Other officers will actually go to tech school before arriving to their new duty station. Okay. And then at my tech school, I also had some guardsmen and reservists who, you know, they were like, this is my fourth career field, right? I'm now going to go take over the force squadron in my home state. 
for our wing. So it was really the gamut of officers. I, I remember I graduated with three lieutenant colonels from tech school. Okay, wow. Which was interesting, right? I will say tech school has changed since I went through it. And I was one of the first ones to kind of go through the first iteration of the consolidated training plan, which is that we used to be three separate career fields, manpower, personnel, and services, like we talked earlier. And then they slowly got merged into two career fields and then one career field. And so I went through that and I learned all the various functions across the squadron because as a second lieutenant, that's what the vast majority of our second lieutenants are going to be doing is they're going to be in a squadron, either a force support squadron or also potentially as a section commander, which we'll cover what they do a little bit later, I think. But they're focused on that. And then they're like, hey, this is kind of what AFPC does, the Air Force Personnel Center. And this is what Air Force A1 does, right? But wave tops so that you can have an understanding of this big, huge family that you've joined. And then we send you back to your squadron. And then at your squadron, you actually have further training that you have to do. You go through and you demonstrate certain skills and you go work with certain sections of your squadron to say, yes, now I understand this. And, and an expert in your squadron validates, yes, this young officer has proven that they are proficient in it. And it's almost like a skills check and we check it off. And then if they complete all of those training requirements, as well as a contingency course, a virtual contingency course where they go through, hey, this is some of the deployed missions that you may be doing, then they're considered a fully trained force support officer. And at the two-year mark, we upgrade them from a one level to a three level. Yeah, okay. That's kind of the first two years in the life of a force support officer. When you look at those initial jobs, I had a unique start as a deputy flight commander. We don't normally do that too often anymore. Okay. What we'll primarily do is we'll start off an officer as within the military personnel flight, hey, you're over the career development section, which handles all of your orders. It handles your separation actions, your reenlistments and extensions for your enlisted airmen, and a couple other factors that they work on. Okay. So, hey, go learn this function and lead this section. Right. Learn leadership, learn how we do orders and how we perform these various functions. And then we may go and say, hey, in a year, we're going to now send you to go be the officer in charge of the fitness center or in charge of food ops at the base. And you're going to be in charge of the DFAC. And again, it's to give them that lower level experience and start testing out those leadership chops as well as building up the experience right. across our very diverse career field. Right. So in addition to being inside the squadron, we will send many of our lieutenants to go be what we call a section commander. Mm -hmm. We'll go put them in a squadron with a large population, a primarily large enlisted population, but just large numbers. And this may be a security forces squadron, a maintenance squadron, a CE squadron, a lot of those ones that are just those, those big organizations because they've just got a constantly job in it and they've got a huge workforce. Yeah. And they're there to help not only run the front office for a commander, the orderly room, if you will, for those older officers on the line, and they're working with the CSS, the commander support staff, to kind of be that administrative leader and make sure that things are flowing. In addition, they may actually be put on G-series orders for certain actions that they can take on behalf of a commander. And it, it's actually an opportunity I never had that when I look back, I'm most jealous of the younger officers and the older officers because I was in like this five-year window where we weren't doing it because we just didn't have the manning. Yeah. And then the Air Force realized, hey, you know, going back to those manpowers, they went, this is really important. We need to bring these back. And so I was in that kind of that window and I missed that opportunity. Yeah. And in that five year window, I was a section commander and helped the Air Force to realize that it's much better to have force support officers yes. be section commanders. <laughs> so you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> now you have it back. Thank you for your service, Colin. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. And it, but it's one of those really cool opportunities because you're, you're learning from a commander and you're learning from a commander who's outside of your field. Yeah. Right. And so that's always something that's very important for force support officers is we have to remember and always be focused on, on what's impacting our mission partners, what's impacting our customers and to have their mindset as well. Try to get into their shoes use emotional intelligence, if you will, to understand where they're coming from. And sometimes that's best learned from a commander of a very large organization. And you're going to see a lot of things that you wouldn't normally see as the OIC of force management inside the NPF. So that's one of the really cool opportunities available to our young officers. Yeah, that was actually a really fantastic opportunity for me to be a section commander and get that kind of you know, personnel manpower view of things. And as a very young lieutenant, have the, I guess, the ear of the commander, you know, to be 
there at his right hand for so many things. And you mentioned G-Series orders. That was not something that I was expecting to be placed on G-Series orders, especially in times of absence of the commander. Obviously, all of the NJP non-judicial punishment kind of stuff, the UCMJ actions, that still belong to someone of higher rank. You know, the operations officer will usually be the kind of person to take that on. But still, there was authority delegated from the squadron commander to me as a young lieutenant. And that was very formative, very informative for me in my growth and development, helping me to become the person that I am now. Oh, absolutely. I would agree. And similarly, sometimes our young officers and our more senior officers as well, senior CGOs, if you will, aka captains, that will also fill the role of executive officer at the group level or higher. Right. And it's a similar role. You shouldn't be on G-series orders at those levels. That's a section (laughs) commander responsibility. And some large organizations at staff levels do have section commanders as well. Yeah. But as the executive officer, you are really focused on being that administrative lead for that front office, that right or left hand for the senior leader. And again, that was an opportunity I had. And to your point, it was incredibly informative to me, eye-opening to me, but also incredibly formative just by watching and observing. That was the conversation I was having with a mentor earlier of, you know, sometimes you want to let the young officer just learn by doing, and you could do it faster, but you let them kind of do it at their pace so they can develop it. Yeah. As an executive officer, that's not an option afforded to you, right? You're doing it very quickly and you're also just watching this leader do, and you do learn through observation. Absolutely. And oftentimes, especially if you're lucky, they'll pull you in, they'll talk you through why they thought they acted the way they did. And it's just an amazing opportunity to learn from some of our more senior leaders. Yeah. So just to summarize some of these, the force support officer will come in, bounce around various areas within the force support squadron. They may be farmed out to another squadron to be a section commander or an executive officer. You mentioned a couple of times they can be an operations officer within the force support, kind of a director of operations, right? Beyond the force support squadron, obviously squadron command, and then there's opportunity for group, wing, higher level command. You know, Colonel Hawkins, Maybe you want to speak to some of that career development, those different positions that force support officers may fill beyond the squadron. Yeah, sure. I think the thing I would add, and maybe dovetails over to the question you just asked there, Colin, is as we talked about in the force support career field, in the force support community, we are really all things people. So when you look at how you develop experienced, credible, you know, informed, and emotionally intelligent leader, whether they're an enlisted leader, civilian leader, officer leader, they've really got to spend time with people. And I think that that's one of the things that Jim talked about, you know, those roles, you know, I think he used the example, you know, we put them out in that function, whether it's in the MPF, whether it's out in the fitness center, whether it's out in, you know, the dining facility, we put them out in that function and we expect them to spend time with people and learning that. And so to keep bridging that up to the question you asked me, you know, in squadron command, You know, we traditionally will fill four support squadron command roles. We also have opportunities to fill recruiting squadron command opportunities if those are available in any given year. And then same for MEPS. Okay. You know, so the MEPS squadron command. And I think it gets back to people again, right? These are functions that other AFSCs can fill. There's no question about that. But you look at who's been developed, you know, through their career to really focus on taking care of people and that entrance phase of people, we really are particularly sensitive to making sure that we've got somebody that's got, like I said that, and Jim said that emotional intelligence about how to deliver support to people and also make sure that we're bringing on the right airmen. And I think that continues, that thread just keeps pulling through the rest of the answer to your question. And so typically you'll find four support officers and mission support group commander roles. It's not exclusive. We'll see some air base group commands that are a little bit more diverse than just your traditional mission support group. They may be slightly smaller in scope based off of the installation size, but an air-based group is generally speaking a little more diverse than just a mission support group. And so we'll step oftentimes into those roles. And then where you see for support leaders, you know, recently is what I'll say, I don't want to say historically, but recently in the Air Force is in a lot of air-based wing opportunities. And then really taking a step to anything that is at the front end of the accession. So whether that's at the Air Force Academy or down at Lackland at the training wing. So I don't want to put them all in the training umbrella because that's not how we 
It's not how we bend them and match comms and everything in the Air Force. But right. if you're dealing with people, cadets, trainees of some sort, whether it's initial skills, entry, officer entry, enlisted entry, you'll see that that's typically jobs that I believe our senior leaders, when they're looking at their many qualified you know, colonels to lead, they do see that the officers who have grown up in the force sport community tend to have characteristics, leadership experiences that give them an opportunity to excel, not better than other officers. I think that that's not, that's, that's an unfair statement for any of us to make, but that are going to excel and really dial in that emotional intelligence to help deliver the wings mission or the group's mission best for the installation. Okay. So that makes sense that there's going to be anywhere that you have that like you said, the front end of a sessions, the, the bringing of people in, the recruiting of talent, the force support officer has the opportunity to lead that effort. And so there's opportunity for them to promote, certainly to Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel, you've got some general officers, you know, 07 up to 09. Are there any four star force support officers? I don't know how far uh, you're able to promote. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, Colin, I think your question is great especially the focus and the flavor of your podcast and your audience, right? So like three and four star mission sets and general officers. And I always, you know, because I've spent a little bit of time in senior leader career management, in my career, I always kind of remind people it's like underscore general officer. That's why yeah. that term exists there. They are general officers, the skills and experiences that our senior leaders are looking for when they're, selecting three and four stars and nominating those leaders to the president for consideration are really broad. They're really, what does the service need? And I will say too, that's similarly true for our senior SESs and our most senior, senior enlisted leaders. So think like SIMSAF level, right? Yeah. So the career field that that person comes from matters a lot less than the experiences that they're bringing and what the Air Force needs at that right time. So to answer your question, you know, we have an Air Force A1 that is a three star that Officer does not have to be a 38F in my career. It's been about half the time, you know, and not like every other year. It's not some magic equation. It just is that in my career, it's been about half the time. It's been a person with a personnel background, which was the legacy career field and now force support background. And we certainly have opportunities for our three stars to progress on to other jobs. It really depends on what the Air Force needs. Yeah. And again, thinking about, right, is the force support officer who's got these experiences building programs that take care of people. And then at that geo level, the SES level, the most senior, senior enlisted level, that's that strategic. What are their experiences bringing that strategic perspective to make sure that the Air Force is organized, trained, and equipped, and Department of the Air Force, frankly, is organized, trained, and equipped to deliver the care that it needs for airmen and guardians? Yeah. Well, I love to think that every career field has the potential to achieve those highest levels of leadership for the Air Force that, you know, that it's possible for a 61 Sierra scientist to become a, a four-star general. But the reality is that it's not actually true. But in the case of the 38 Foxtrot, it is true. There is great potential for promotion all the way up to the highest levels of the Air Force where you can achieve that rank. But even just putting the rank aside, because the Air Force cares about people, and because there is this entire directorate of the A-1, there's this opportunity for the force support officer to have an impact on the Air Force at the highest level, greatest strategic impact, widest application. And I think that there should be the greatest draw for anybody that wants to become a force support officer. One, that you get to be directly involved with the people aspect of what we do, and that there is an opportunity for you to be involved in that mission at every level of the Air Force, every possible location where we operate, the force support officer is going to be there. Yeah, I like the way you characterize that, Colin. Something that I tell friends of mine, you know, if I'm in a mentoring opportunity with junior officers, whether they're, you know, ROTC cadets or junior ROTC cadets, or maybe just in high school, you know, students thinking about a career, is that that impact, right? And we work in a career field and in a community and just kind of like an industry, as it were, yeah. where we don't really have, and I've spent a lot of time in operational squadrons and supporting operational squadrons, and I love it. And I absolutely respect the work they do. That's not something, my brain's not wired that way. 
So I'm glad we've got professionals that love aviating and love the operational mission set. We don't work at a mission set where we have a brief, you know, we go, we launch, we come back, we have a debrief, and then we're done. And we, we can high five and, you know, and I'm making a little tongue in cheek comment here. Sure. We are always going. There are very few things we do in the A1 community that have really finite start and finite finishes to them. And again, I recognize tongue in cheek, that's a lot of our communities in the Air Force. But what has been a real rewarding experience for me across my career is the impact. There has never been a, I don't want to go so far off the deep end and say a day, there's never been a career you know, task that I've had where at the end of it, I didn't really recognize the impact I had. Sometimes the impact is on an airman and their family. And, you know, frankly, I'll be honest with you, with Jim going back to the base level, the installation level, I think that's sometimes the best when you can make a difference for an airman and their family. And I don't care what their rank is. I don't, sometimes I'm making a difference for a chief. Sometimes I'm making a difference for, you know, a civilian who's been in for 25 years. And sometimes I'm making a difference for a young airman and their spouse who just entered the Air Force and they weren't aware of something. And now we've got a problem solved for them. Yeah. And then sometimes, you know, like you've been talking about, the experiences we go through as support support officers just leaving AFPC, I was a part of a team that was making impact for the whole Air Force mm-hmm. on how we do our evaluation programs and how we do promotion processes. And that small team there at AFPC making sure that we get this right because it matters to the entire department of the Air Force, yeah. guardians and airmen, that you know we have got confidence in our systems and behind those systems are people, and there are force support professional people, you know, doing those. And so I think each time, like you said, you can really take a step back and see the impact you have. And that, I will say, isn't always something that's true about some other career fields. You can't always see the impact you have as readily, and that's something that we get to enjoy in our career field. Absolutely. Well, I think we're going to pause there so that we can allow this to sink in. As they look ahead to next week's episode, which is going to be all about that type of impact that you're able to have as force support officers at the highest levels of the Department of the Air Force. But before we turn off the mic, we end every episode, you know, these interviews with the question, what does it mean to be an officer? So we're going to do that. But because I get you for another episode next week, we're only going to do it one at a time. So Jim, I'm going to ask you that question and then the audience can hear Colonel Hawkins, your answer next week. So over to you, Jim, what does it mean to be an officer? Okay. Well, first, Colin, if I can flip that question on to you and ask you, what's your thoughts? What does being an officer mean to you? How dare you? (laughs) (laughs) It's your show. You could just say no. (laughs) I could, but I'm not going to. To me, being an officer means that you are responsible for the character, competence, and the connection, not only of yourself, but of the people around you. And to earn that special trust and confidence from the American people, from your airmen, and translate that into mission success. I like it. (laughs) The audience didn't come here for my answer. They came here to hear from Jim, what does it mean to be an officer? Okay. So what I will say is, is A, I love your answer. And if you'll allow me, I will try not to overlap too much with it, but there will probably be some similarities. Okay. For me, what it means in its simplest form is that you're a leader, a professional leader, if you will. That is your profession. And that from day one, as an officer is always honing those leadership skills. They may be given other skills to hone, other experiences that we want them to gain and garner and develop, but that the most important skill for them is leadership. And that even if you're that new butter bar in that flying squadron and you're a leader of one, right, or whatever organization you're in, and you're like, I'm not in charge of anything, you need to start honing those leadership skills, because that is what it means to be an officer. It means to be a leader. And very few other places in life, or in corporations or organizations, have a position like that, where on day one, you go into that knowing that maybe not today am I a leader, but one day I will be, and it'll change incredibly fast. And so that for me is what it's about is leading your people. And I could expand upon that for another 30 minutes on, on the details. But I will keep it to that. What it means to be an officer is is that you are a leader. Excellent. I love it. And like you said, Colonel Hawkins, the audience will be able to hear your answer. We're going to give you a chance here to mull it over for a little bit. And uh, make me wait. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's right. Tune in next week to find out. (laughs) That's right. Well, thank you so much for explaining the 38 Foxtrot for support career field. This has been very helpful for me. I hope it has also been helpful to the audience. And again, we invite you to tune in next week as we discuss the airman leadership qualities and the perspective from headquarters Air Force. All right, Reed. So we've now heard from these two gentlemen. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Josh. Thank you both for sharing your perspective. I think before we get into some of the things that we want to highlight out of this read, there's a couple of definitions or things that we need to make sure that the audience understands for the rest of this to truly make sense. Agreed. The first one there is, we talked a lot about this idea of people sustainment. Now, mission sustainment is something that gets talked about in the Air Force all the time. Not so much people sustainment. That's kind of an unofficial term that uh, was brought up there. But mission sustainment in the Air Force, there's actually an AFI 90201. This one talks about mission sustainment, and therein we find a definition, which is that mission sustainment is to preserve, protect military readiness by mitigating and preventing current potential risks. We want to preserve capability and identify and assess these hazards to mission success through a variety of means. And so we can take that same idea of mission sustainment and then apply it in the people context, that we want to preserve capability of a person just like we want to preserve a capability of an aircraft. And just like an aircraft needs fuel, it needs you know regular rest cycles where it gets rebuilt and repaired and those kinds of things, people need the same thing, right? And that then leads to the next thing that we need to define, which is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yeah, agreed. So it's something you and our two guests talked about, and I'm not certain how many people know about it. If you don't, don't worry, we're a quick primer. If you've gone through an sessions program, you've heard this. Maslow was a American psychologist who was very interested in what motivates people to do what they do. And he developed this idea of a hierarchy. And the basic premise is that unless the level below where you are is taken care of, you can't progress along this spectrum. And it starts with the things that we all think about, air, water, food, shelter, sleep. Yeah. You know, these are our physiological needs, the things we physically need to be alive. Then it moves up to safety. Do you feel safe? Do you, is your personal, physical self safe? Are your resources safe? Not just physical, Reed. Mental, too. Yeah. Yes, I agreed. Yes, absolutely. So that's where I was moving to. You know, is your property safe? Is your health safe? If those things are always under threat, then you're not going to be able to progress to the next level, which is love and belonging. Do you have friendships? Do you have intimacy? Do you have family, a sense of connection? The next step is esteem. Do you have respect for yourself and respect for others? Are you starting to generate or be influenced by ideas of recognition or independence or freedom? And the last is self-actualization. And this is the idea that the world is your oyster. You can be anything you want and put your mind to accomplish. And this hierarchy is something that we're taught as officers because we have to address. Sometimes we'll see airmen acting in ways that maybe don't make sense logically, but if we can determine that there's something further down that pyramid that isn't being addressed, it's going to prevent them from performing at their highest level. And so you talked about that with our 38 Fox trot, you know, these for support because of how critical it was. And I thought that was a really good thing that you described, but I also want to make sure we define that for the audience just in case they weren't familiar. Yes, exactly right, Reed. The 38 Fox trot for support career field exists to make sure that these hierarchy of needs are met so that we can sustain the people side of the Air Force. That's how this all relates together and feeds into really the one thing that I want to pull out of this interview that was definitely a new shift in thinking for me. We all know that the Air Force enjoys a high quality of life. That's one of the primary reasons why people want to join our service, right? Is because they know when they go to an Air Force base, it's going to look nice and be well taken care of. That when they go into a dining facility, there's going to be food to eat and not just MREs, right? And, you know, tongue in cheek, but, you know, our golf courses, the golf courses on the base are a reflection of this higher quality of life that airmen enjoy. And we aren't just saying that as airmen. Right. 
we get told this all the time by our brothers and sisters in arms from other services all the time. Yeah. And it, it often comes, you know, as a jab, you know, like, okay, we are going to go sleep in our tent. You enjoy your five-star hotel kind of thing, but you know, they're not wrong. Right. And I often thought of this and would explain it to people in terms of this being a result of the way the air force does business, the way we project air power. Let's see if I can explain this a little bit. So when the air force needs to send an aircraft down range, it requires a lot of things to make that happen. There has to be a runway, people who do maintenance on it. There has to be the operations side of things that actually flies the aircraft. There have to be hangars. Then there has to be security. There has to be fuel. Well, this grows and grows and grows to the point where in order to just project air power to generate the mission, not even the sustainment piece, but just force generation, you have to have a base. The base is the weapon system for the Air Force, not the aircraft, but the base. And because we care so deeply about the base itself, that is what then drives looking and being nicer, just as a Marine or a soldier is going to take care of their rifle because that is how they project power downrange. That's what the base is for us. Now, the conversation with Jim and Josh, especially when they brought up the amount of investment that the Air Force puts into the people sustainment side of things, the quality of life, and that there aren't military members focused specifically on that aspect of what we do in the other services, something flipped for me. That it's not just the way that we do business, but it's because it's something that we value. Because we care about quality of life for our airmen and their families, and we as an Air Force are willing to invest in that, providing resources and manpower for it, that then allows for the nicer bases and the more effective projection of air power downrange. So that's the thing that flipped there. Reed, I want to get your thoughts on it too, though. I love how you describe that because I, like you, used to think of it as... I always use the Navy analogy, like this is my ship, this is my vessel, Mm -hmm. this is how I project power, and so I'm going to take care of it because it's going to take care of me. Yeah. Not too dissimilar from how you described a Marine and their rifle. But I loved how both of these gentlemen described how much the Air Force values it. And we've talked about before how a demonstration of how much we value something is where we put our money. And I know that sounds, well, logical, duh, money, value. But now I'm being serious. Like when we actually put money against something, that is signaling how much we care. And so, yeah, that really flipped it. And I also did not know that other military services didn't have military members doing this. That just seems illogical to me. But that's why I'm an airman, because life is good here. Two quick, really quick stories. I've known multiple members who have transferred from other services into the Air Force explicitly for quality of life. One was a Army infantry officer, was told to go into their tent while they were on an exercise and count how many functioning plugs, you know, like actual plugins were working. (laughs) He came back, reported, and then his CO said, I want one functioning plug in there. Go fix it. (laughs) And, And he's like, you want me to break things? He's like, if it's too nice in the tent, they won't go out on patrol. (laughs) <laughs> and that's when he said, I- I'm in the wrong service. <laughs> so that's one example. Second one, Marine, infantry, grunt, enlisted, was on R&R, was sent to a dining facility of one of our places, an Air Force dining facility downrange, and instantly knew he had chosen poorly and needed to change <laughs> services. And now he was an 05 in the Air Force Intel doing great things. So, And these are not isolated instances. No, they're not. You'll talk to you know a career Army soldier and their child is looking at joining the army and like, oh, no, 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 no. You're going to join the Air Force. Yeah, we've had multiple interviews just on this podcast where that yes. very conversation has come up. Exactly. So this isn't just us, you know, popping the jersey. Like, we've literally seen this. And I am grateful for that. I depend on these services. I use them. I'm grateful for them. They are a significant reason why I love being an airman. And even more appreciative after listening to these two gentlemen. I did want to bring up a couple other things. So I'm an FGO now. I'm in a leadership position. And I understood that spaces and faces were important. Mm -hmm. Yep. I grossly underestimated how much time I would be spending looking at spaces and faces. So I, I direct operations. That's my job. Yeah. 
but who do operations, Colin? Who makes that happen? Other people, not yeah, you. Yeah, not me. <laughs> so without the right people in the right positions at the right time, operations don't go the way they should. And so while it is the commander's responsibility to ensure that his unit has the appropriate manpower, he needs feedback from me on how the mission is going in order to make that happen. Yeah. So the two of us spend an inordinate amount of time worrying about spaces and faces and you know, talking to the fams on base to make sure the right skill sets are in the right place at the right time, not only for the member, but for the unit and for all the other millions of things you have to consider. I do this a lot. Yeah. And so it's super helpful to understand more about the process and more about the people behind it so that hopefully I can not screw it up. That's what I'm going for, Colin. Just don't screw it up. You know, that's, that's what I'm focused on right now for sure. Yeah. And if you think about some of the conversations that we've had previously about the kinds of relationships that are most important for the success of an officer, I've brought up previously that you need to know the finance officer and the contracting officer because they handle all of the money. Well, I'm going to amend that. You need to know the OIC of the manpower and personnel flight. Yep. You need to have that person sitting next to you explain to you how these things work. Because if you don't, exactly as you're describing here, Reed, you're not going to be able to address a lot of these holes in your manning and in your ability to accomplish the mission. And good luck trying to figure it out on your own, right? Yeah. By the time you do, it'll be too late. Yeah. Money and people. You want to accomplish the mission? Money and people. So listen up, all of you young lieutenants, those that are about to come into the military. As soon as you get to your base, find out those people. Go talk to those people. Become friends with the force support officers, the finance officers, and the contracting officers because they control money and people. They are going to help you be more successful, especially as you continue to grow up together and move into the FGO and higher levels of leadership. Yeah, solid. And I cannot begin to describe how real that is. I knew it, but I am a witness. I can testify. Now, I didn't. I knew before, but I can testify. The next thing I really loved about Major Nardelli and Lieutenant Colonel Hawkins, something I think we're all a victim of, and this is just human nature, but there's a little bit of the grass is always greener syndrome with all of us. You know, there's always a cooler job. We always want to be more tactical than we are. You know, if all we do is stay in base in our windowless rooms like the rest of Intel does, you know, we want to strap on a rifle and jump out of a helicopter. You know, I think we all have this tendency. I loved how these two gentlemen owned their responsibility. Yeah. And I think that is a great example for all of us. Now, I don't want to say that that doesn't mean you shouldn't be aspirational. I don't want to say that you shouldn't stretch yourself or grow or have ideas about how you can improve. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying... Own your position and own your role in this big machine that is the United States Air Force. Whatever that is, if you hand out towels at the gym, be the best one ever. If you fly the F-22 Raptor, be the best one ever. Yeah. Whatever your role is, just lean in. And I just loved how they just owned it. And it inspired me, and it's something I'm going to try to try to own more. Yeah, I'm an Intel guy and I'm happy about it. And I'm just going to lean in. That's who I am. I'm not wishing I was somebody else. Can I just qualify that a little bit? I don't, yeah. I don't mean to temper it, but let's just put it into a slightly different perspective because where you love being an Intel officer, I love civil engineering, but I also recognize that I was not a good one. And so taking your advice to heart for someone like me I need to be the best civil engineering officer that I can be. Yes. Not the best one, the best that I can be. And that there will help you to eventually find the thing that you can be the best at, right? Yeah. I'm not saying that I'm cross-training into space operations and there I'm going to be the best. But I can already tell just in the amount of time that I've been there that I have found something that is much more in line with my desires, my passions, my skill set. And it was the things that I did as a civil engineer that enabled me to make that transition. So whatever you are, 
If you find yourself in a career field that you don't like, if you find yourself in a position that you don't like, be the best that you can in that thing until the next opportunity comes your way. And you being as good as possible will make that transition far more likely and successful. Yeah, totally fair. I like how you qualified that with be the best version of you in that thing. I like that. Yeah, totally. Yeah. You know, I sometimes hear people kind of wishing that they were doing a cooler job. You know, I, like I said, that grass is greener thing. And yeah, yeah, it really spoke to me. And so I love that about about the conversation. The whole thing was great. Like I said, Colin, at the intro, I listened. I didn't take notes. I was too busy learning. So for me, that's a, a sign that it's going to be a good one. And I've certainly gained an appreciation for what these folks do. Well, Major Nardelli and Lieutenant Colonel Harkins are going to come right back next week to help you learn even more, Reed, as well as myself and our audience. There is more to come about not just the 38 Foxtrot career fields, but what they can do at the highest levels of the Air Force. We're going to have a conversation about these airman leadership qualities that we mentioned back in February, and they're going to teach us, and we're going to listen, and we're going to all be better for it. So... Huge thanks to Major Nardelli, Lieutenant Colonel Hawkins, Jim and Josh. Thank you both so much. And we're looking forward to hearing from you again next week. Anything else, Reed? Nope, that'll do it. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Commission Ed. Commission Ed.